Welcome back to this, our second short lecture as an introduction to our conversation that will be happening uh, shortly uh, together. And uh, a first little go at, at applying our approach to another religion and identifying their elements of the narrative of Jesus found within it and what that might mean. And of course, we can only do that in a very limited way in a short space of time. However, uh, in, in the interests of learning together how to think about these things and how to approach them rather than necessarily what to think, uh, this is really just a taster, a glimpse in a sense of how we might begin the approach. And so in keeping with the method that we uh, thought about in the first little lecture, I'm going to acknowledge up front that I'm not an Islamic scholar. There, are, there is so much about Islam that I do not know. I have met and uh, been with many Muslims in their worship services, in conversations and so on, but that is more of a relational thing. Uh, I have many good friends who are Islam. Uh, people of the Islamic religion and faith and, and I have great respect for those people that I know. But I just want to state uh, up front that my own formation is in the Christian tradition and I have very firm theological views um, uh, about the way to engage my own tradition in, with critical self-reflection and, uh, and I know that I have been formed in the tradition within Christianity that embraces the world and nature as good and as part of God's life. And so that informs my reading of Islam and it informs the judgments that I make about the presence of Jesus in Islam. And you'll hear that as, I, as my reflections unfold and they will form um, part of what you can critique about my approach and what I can critique about my approach as well. I hope you can hear in that the uh, intended humility of my approach to Islam and what I perceive there in terms of the presence of Jesus. I hope you enjoyed Larson's article. It's an apologetic approach. Uh, that is, his intent in comparing the two narratives about Jesus uh, is to persuade the Muslim devotee to embrace a personal relationship with Jesus. So it's in that sense um, an evangelistic uh, attempt. Uh, and whilst this is not our approach to Islam in this instance, the article is helpful in that it provides a warm comparative method that focuses on difference as much as it does on similarity. So there's a real genuine regard for the Islamic text and the Islamic traditions with regards to Jesus. Uh, and, uh, and that is really uh, helpful for us in terms of our analysis and our attempts to identify who Jesus is in that tradition. Uh, it's helpful in particular, uh, in particular for me, from my tradition as someone uh, in Christianity who emphasises um, those texts that embrace the world and human existence, uh, that when I read the Jesus in Islamic texts, they reveal to me what I would call a Gnostic tendency in Islam. And though Christianity itself is not entirely free of the Gnostic influence, it highlights the stronger, historically more influential embrace of existence, the world and nature in the Gospels and, for example, uh, the epistle uh, to, uh, of James. But rather than simply point the finger at Islam and decry uh, its repudiation of carnal existence, Paul Tillich invites us in his chapter, Christianity Judging Itself, that I've shared with you, to pay attention to the particularities in each religious tradition because the particularities the, um, those things that um, are particular about that religion, if, if followed closely in, into an analysis of their depth, reveal a level of ultimate concern that is universal in all religious traditions. So in that sense, the heart of every religious tradition in Tillich's view, the underlying concern for the world and for humanity, uh, can often be seen to be uh, universally shared um, throughout not only religious traditions, but also many quasi-religious traditions, political movements, social movements, etc. Now, I know that that in itself can be a controversial claim, uh, but what, what we're going to use that claim for today is to simply put a pause on the tendency to say, oh, look, 
Jesus in Islam isn't as good as Jesus in Christianity. Um, no, we want to actually listen carefully to what the intent is underlying the Islam, Islamic dealing of the traditions of, of its own traditions of Jesus. Nevertheless, as such, the particular signals of Gnostic influence in the way Islam depicts Jesus are of ultimate significance because they reveal the ultimate concern at the heart of Islam itself uh, with salvation from the world. Let me briefly draw, before we go on, from the Oxford Companion to Philosophy, which has a good succinct, succinct definition of Gnosticism. And on, on the basis of this definition, hopefully you, you'll be able to hear something of the Gnostic influence in the text that, that's been shared and, and some of the texts that Larson uh, examines in his article. This is what the Companion to Philosophy says about Gnosticism. Gnosticism was a dualistic, was a du was dualist, sorry, which means that two um, binary or separate parts of reality. Uh, it distinguishes the spiritual and the good world from the evil and material world. So spiritual and good are correlated and evil and material or physical, physio physiological, material world uh, are correlated. And those two things are in opposition to one another. Matter, it goes on to say, was the creation of a wicked demiurge but a spiritual saviour had come to offer redeeming gnosis or knowledge of our true spiritual selves. The Gnostic would be released from the material world, the non-Gnostic doomed to reincarnation. And there were all kinds of Gnostic uh, family um, cults that were part of the uh, uh, early New, New Testament period and uh, they had their influence on Christianity itself, although ultimately Gnosticism was repudiated by the New Testament tradition. The Jesus of Islam, and you may have picked this up in Larson's um, examination uh, and even in the part of the text that I shared with you, the Jesus of Islam is a, prophet, a prophetic conduit for the spirit sent by Allah. He is held to be so in the prophetic tradition that has its ultimate fulfilment in the prophet Muhammad. What interests us in this small part of a much bigger conversation is the way in which Jesus in Islam is represented as ontologically separate from God, his human, humanness being of such fundamental difference to the divine essence that the two cannot be identified. As Larson suggests, in Islam, God would never get his hands dirty with an incarnation. And this is evident in the small portion of the Quran that we have considered together. In 4.171, Jesus is depicted as no more than a bearer of the word of Allah and the spirit sent out from Allah. In bearing these from Allah, Jesus shows himself to be no more than a servant of Allah. Now hold our prejudices and our preconceived ideas about that and try and listen positively underneath that to the ultimate concern that drives Islam to depict Jesus uh, in this way. The insistence in Islam that the flesh can never be identified with the divine is the seat of the Gnostic tendency in Islam. The ultimate concern underlying the dualistic separation of spirit and matter of historical Jesus, for example, from the divine spirit in Islam can be traced, as it can be in Christianity, to the Platonic ideals. Existence, and here is the ultimate concern, existence is deemed to be of lesser value or to be repudiated uh, or saved from or out of because it contains contingency, uncertainty and limitation, unholiness. The primary danger, however, in Gnostic religion is its neglect of the natural world of human experience and the implicit physiological dignity of bodies. The corrective uh, prior to Islam in Christianity, though only a partial corrective, is the tradition of the incarnation. And this is also the corrective. The corrective really is the historically the corrective of, uh, against the Gnostic tendency in New Testament times. The inclusion of the embodied Christ, Jesus, at the ontological centre of divine life takes into the life of God 
all of the contingency, uncertainty and limitation of existence and embraces it as the nature of life itself. For this reason, it is almost impossible for the mind shaped by Gnostic assumptions to understand the Christian idea of God that has at its heart the embrace, not the repudiation, of matter, of existence, of life. Now really, uh, in that very brief glimpse of one of the issues at the heart of the different depictions of Jesus, the difference between that presented by most of the Christian tradition and that presented in Islam, uh, just gives us a, a taster of the, the great conversation that unfolds about the, the different ultimate concerns that lie at the heart of those two religions. In fact, both have a concern for uh, divine life, uh, healing all relationships. But um, whereas Islam emphasises saving from in a dualistic sense, Christianity emphasises the recreation, the saving into a deeper enfleshed carnal reality that depicts the very nature of God that holds within it uh, all of the goodness of matter, nature, and the physical world. And there we have a great conversation right there based on who Jesus was and who he is uh, in the depictions of the divine of those two different religions. I look forward to ex an extension of this conversation when we gather together.